water in. You get. <laughs> you okay, Dale? <laughs> you Dale, you're on mute, brother. You need one of us. You need one of us to jump in, do the Heimlich, and also get you off mute. <laughs> I, do the I think Chris might be able to like dive to his right and come in. Yeah. <laughs> so now, what's the field all, condition like at what all, else, Sam? This cue is on here. All coaches have to be CPR certified. So we that's are. Right. That's right. That's I think right. I have to be CPR certified to graduate, but I don't know how that's going to happen. So, uh oh. All right. Yeah. We're, getting, we're getting the audience. Let's get started. We got Miss Tucker. Let's go. All right, we're here with uh, another episode of Talking Preps on a special night Wednesday. I know all you guys were enjoying the madness. I got so many emails saying, I'm glad you moved the show. So, but we'll be back on our normal night next week on Wednesday. But uh, I want to get right to it. We've got a really busy show. We've got uh, Q Tucker, the commissioner of the NCHSA, down at the bottom of the screen. How you doing, Q? Doing great, Langston. Great to be with you tonight. Thanks for joining us. We got a lot of people that want us to have you on and had questions for you. But before I get started, we lost a legend today in Jim Odo. I know you knew him. And I just want to kind of get your thoughts on uh, Coach Odo and what he meant. Oh, wow. I did not know that. Um, so, so sad to hear that. Uh, he was just one of the nicest men I, I had ever met as it relates to uh, what he was doing with his with his students, he he was just uh, he obviously was a competitor, no doubt about it. But it was such a gentleman. Whenever I I saw him, and uh, I always felt like he cared about his kids and really tried to run a top notch program. And uh, you know what a loss. Uh, we we need more coaches like Coach Odo, and uh, he left a legacy that uh, won't soon be repeated. And so I wish his family the best as they're going through this time. Uh, I know that's a loss for the Charlotte Catholic family and community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was a very big loss. Uh, Coach meant so much. We're going to talk a lot more about him. Coach Mike Newsom is going to join the show, and Chris is going to off some thoughts with Dale, and, and we're going to come back to that. But Q, I, I, gotta, I always ask you about your crystal ball. <laughs> right. OK. So uh, last time you told me your crystal ball was cloudy and we did not play in the fall. Tell me what your crystal ball is telling you about this coming fall with uh, high school sports. What do you say? Well, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's partly cloudy. It's no, let's say it's partly sunny. Um, I think yeah. that the the vaccine obviously was a game changer. Um, I think the more news we hear about vaccines possibly being available for, uh, you know, high school students uh, in the in the summer, uh, maybe even in time to start school, obviously is a game changer. Um, but I think all of those signs point to us being able to to start fall sports as we normally do. Uh, which is August 1, and that's what our staff um, is gearing towards. And uh, when we meet with our board of directors the last of um, the month of April, uh, we obviously will be talking about, um, you know, just kind of projecting a little bit. But I, I say partly sunny, uh, Langston, and that's a good thing. I was talking to the executive director up in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Bob Lombardi, um, yesterday, and uh, he said the same thing. He said, Q, I really think and hope that we're going to be able to start uh, on time as we have in the past. And uh, I think that's what everybody across the country is thinking right now who's in state association business. All right. Um, the NFL, you probably saw, is going to go back to full fans next year. Um, what do you see in terms of fans with the association? I know right now we can have 50 percent. There were a bunch of fans at Shelby the other day, and Dale's going to ask you about that later. But what do you see for fans right now? Do you think we could be back to normal with fans? Well, I, 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 I do, but I think a lot of what we will project ahead as we look in that crystal ball, I think it, it will stay partly sunny, provided we as adults continue to do the right thing, because obviously we're role modeling for the young people uh, the way things need to happen and what needs to occur. Uh, but if we get careless, we get reckless, 
and we don't do what we're supposed to do, then we could find ourselves uh, not being able to to have a stadium full of people. Um, I'm hopeful, uh, you know, obviously when Governor Cooper signed this current executive order, moving us up to 50 percent, that was a good sign. But as we look not only in North Carolina, but we look across the country, we've seen an uptick uh, in cases. Uh, so those don't bode well. Uh, but I think it just, again, means that we have to be cautious. We have to continue to, you know, to wear the mask. We have to continue to wash our hands and, and social distance. Uh, I'd like to think that for sure when we start August 1, uh, we'll be at 75 percent of our stadium capacity. And, um, you know, with with the idea that we could be back the way we were, uh, you know, later in the fall of the year. Yeah, but we all hope we get to that point and we'd love to be at that point right now. And thank you for joining us. Uh, we always enjoy having you on. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we talk about between week to week in our texting. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up this past week was endowment games and length of season and how long the season is and how worn out coaches are actually before the season starts. So the question is, do you think we could do away with the endowment game to shorten the season? And, or is that going to hurt the uh, financials of the uh, NCHSAA too much? <laughs> well, obviously all of you know, I've been all over the news about our financials of late. So <laughs> uh, that that's a great question. Obviously, uh, you know, contributions to the endowment benefit schools. People don't understand endowments and how they work and don't understand, uh, you know, why the endowment of the NCHSA was, was started. However, we do believe and we've talked with our board about this, that as we move forward, one of the things that we think we can do is to pause endowment games across the board. Um, now, what that means is that schools won't have uh, currently, let's just use basketball right now. Uh, we've said that you could play 23 games, but then you add one. So you would have 24. Well, we've already shortened the season. At, if you've looked at the calendar and what we've already done moving into next year, uh, basketball season will be shortened by two games. Uh, football will be shortened by one game. Uh, so there are no endowment games built into the calendar or into the, the season limitations for next year. What we'll do is continue to talk about that with our board to try to figure out, uh, do we just simply pause uh, even the dollar surcharge as we move into the playoffs uh, and that there would be no monies going into the, uh, to the endowment fund? How will that hurt? Uh, how do we look at that as we move along? The one thing you never want to do is get to a point where the endowment, the investments, if we have a year, let's say like we did in 2008, uh, when we just, you know, we did that nosedive, we do not want to be in a situation where the investments, uh, you know, with the endowed dollars uh, go downhill and then we have to stop our um, you know, we take a hit. Our endow our scholarship program takes a hit. Uh, some of the ways in which we've been giving monies back to the schools, ways we've been assisting coaches to take coaches' education, all of those things could be hampered if endowment dollars, uh, you know, go away or they start to shrink. The more money you have, obviously, the more money you're able to make. Um, you know, all you have to do, and I do the same thing, is I look at my little savings account. It's not that much money in the savings account. And the less money you have in the savings account, it, the less money it's going to make just simply because of the interest rate. So when Charlie Adams and the boards back in those days looked at endowment games, the idea was, well, we'll try to go, you know, for a period of time, let the, in, let the investments do their thing. And hopefully we get to a point where it will have grown and we'll be able to do some great things. So the, the, to circle back to your question, there are no endowment games built into the schedule for next year. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, yes, dental with some allergies, so sorry if my uh, voice isn't a hundred percent. But uh, I wanted to ask if some teams do not play their game and end up with fewer losses, will that hurt some of the teams that have played all of their games, or will that be taken into account uh, for the wild card procedure? Uh, just to say that two, uh, three, and one teams decide to make up games uh, and keep both with one loss, but other teams continue to play and end up with two losses. How is that going to affect the seeding? here in a couple of weeks it, oh so you're talking about currently yes uh, okay. right now football yes well obviously you know the way it is it, it's uh set up right now is that it it your conference standings will be submitted and each conference gets x number of teams in because we do have the reduced field so you're right if a three and O team. So let's say we have a football team that only was able to play three games for whatever reason. Well, that three and O team in that conference, if it finished, depending on how it, you know, finished in the conference, if the conference overall didn't play very many games and, and then you have a, you know, that three and O team is going to be better than a team that perhaps lost a game or two, depending on how many of the conference plays. So yes, it could hurt this year. But again, when all of this was put in place, there were so many unknowns and, uh, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda is something Coach Yao used to say. If we could have looked deeper into that crystal ball and known differently, maybe we would have done differently in terms of how we set that up. But the seeding for football and the remainder of the team Sports will be exactly as it has been for all of the others. There will be no adjustments. And that's been one of the things that we've had football coaches asking us, uh, you know, are you guys going to make an adjustment? You've seen how it worked in the other sports. Are you going to do anything different? And the answer to that is no. Good evening, Q. Um, before I ask my questions, first of all, I'd like to commend you and your staff on how you handle basketball season. I was an assistant coach during basketball season, and I thought it went along fairly smoothly for the most part. Um, everybody was happy to be there. And, you know, you really didn't hear any complaints until it was time for the playoff bracket drawing. But, you know, that we knew what the situation going in hand. But thanks, thanks again for a, a good basketball season that you and your staff um, put together. Thank you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had Mac Brown on the program. And one of the questions we asked him was, what would he like to see differently in North Carolina high school athletics uh, compared to what they do in Texas? Okay. It got me to thinking if all the schools are playing by the same rules and all the teachers are on the same salary scale as far as how much they get paid and how much um, based on their years of experience, then how come the state or maybe the NCSHAA, how come they can't set up a salary structure um, for high school coaches because a, a system as big as CMS is paid less than a lot of smaller school systems around the state. Is there anything that the state could do about high school coaches pay? Because they're underpaid. Well, first of all, you know that I was a classroom teacher. So first and foremost, I believe classroom teachers are underpaid, period. You're right. The, and, and something needs to be done about that before we ever start talking about supplemental salaries. I would agree. Um, but it, the NCHSAA has no say in salaries. Uh, we have nothing to do with hiring and firing of personnel. And I'm glad of that. Uh, we periodically will get a copy or ask athletic directors. Typically, it goes through our Athletic Directors Association. They will collect data and take a look at salary structure across the state. And it, you're right, it is interesting in terms of how some school systems pay compared to some of the other school systems. But so much of that has to do with 
resources for certain school systems. So let's just take, for example, I'll pick on Northeastern North Carolina, a small school system like Gates County, limited resources. Um, and so that that board of education and that, that board of county commissioners is they're looking to try to help supplement the amount of dollars that they're getting from the state, it's going to be very difficult for them to supplement at the same level that a Wake County or a CMS or Wake uh, Winston-Salem Forsyth County. So I don't know that we will ever be at a point where every school system, every LEA would be in a position to be able to pay on the same level from coast to the mountains. Uh, I, that would be great, but I don't think that'll ever happen just simply because there's so much that goes into those supplements and what's available to that school system in terms of, of, of providing the resources. But you're right. A state like Texas, where football is king in the state, a uh, high school football is king. Uh, you know, I don't know what they pay those football coaches there. I don't really even I know that in South Carolina, for example, Football coaches make a lot of money, which is why we have a lot of our coaches leave North Carolina and go to South Carolina. Their facilities are that are, are way better. We understand that, um, but you know, I think that's a that's wishful thinking. But just having been in the school system for 14, 15 years before I moved along, uh, I just don't ever I don't see supplements because that's where you're. Coaches, coaches supplements are just that. They supplement the teaching salary, or if it is a non-faculty coach, that's going to come out of a different pot of money. And I just don't think school systems have that kind of money to be able to do that. Um, okay. My second question for you, earlier in our conversation tonight with the panel, you mentioned about um, being in the news about the legislators inquiring about the endowment funds. Mm -hmm. um, what has become of that inquiry and um, how have you addressed it or is it still ongoing? Well, it's still ongoing. Um, we address the financial structure the same way any organization addresses finances. The membership is always privy to the finances of the association. Every year when we crisscross the state during regional meetings, and we did it this year by Zoom, uh, we share financial information. We share our budget information. Um, we share that we, we let them know how the dollars are broken out in terms of what we pay back to the schools, um, you know, those kinds of things. So so we are uh, we we try to be as transparent as as we need to be and there are folks who are saying that we're not transparent uh, there are those folks who say that the high school athletic association should not have an endowment um, that we you know we have too much money in the endowment uh, but again the endowment is set up and it is planned uh, uh, disbursements, um, just like we were able to disperse that four million dollars, uh, and every ch every school across the state, whether they played any sports or not, they received a check in the first week of February. Every school that is playing sports, depending on the number of sports they play, JV and varsity, will get another check at the end of May to finish out the $4 million. So, you know, I, I'm not real sure that people really understand. It is an ongoing uh, inquiry. Um, I, I've had to provide information to legislators, uh, but again, people do not understand the history of the association. They do not understand our relationship with the State Board of Education. So it has been one of those, uh, it's been a process whereby we're trying to educate the legislators. And even we have people in our membership that do not understand the structure. They do not read the bylaws. They do not read the articles of incorporation that are in the front of every handbook every year. And if they would just read that, it paints the picture how we came into existence. 
It talks about the relationship not only with UNC, but it talks about our relationship with the State Board of Education. We started out with the Constitution. Uh, late 50s, that changed. And then in, in the 70s, we did away with the Constitution. We incorporated in 1978, formally incorporated and became a 501c3 in 1978. Uh, so people don't understand that. So I'm continuing, uh, it, you know, to try to educate. And it doesn't help that people have not liked the executive orders and the fact that we've had limited seating capacity and so that we've been all in the news. And so you add that to the mix. Now you have the general public who wants to know more than they know. And so that has caused legislators to get involved. And, you know, again, we are as transparent as our members want us to be. And anything they want to know about finances, we'll let them know because they're the membership. Great. Yeah. Oh, one, one fun question. Yes. Sir. We're going to have a coach's clinic this summer. <laughs> well, it's my understanding that the uh, Mac Mars, Phil Weaver and Joe Franks met with the Coliseum about two weeks ago. They are moving forward with the coaches clinic. Uh, it's going to be different. I think if, in fact, they're able to have it, it will not be the, the big clinic that we're used to. Uh, but they are trying to pull one off. Uh, I don't think they have any concrete details at this point, but I think we're all just, you know, we're all in that same boat. We're watching and waiting to see what it looks like with the idea that maybe we will be able to go to Greensboro and that coaches will be able to come and at least get their picture with the idea that we'll be back, uh, you know, towards a semblance of normalcy. Great. Great. Good stuff. Well, Q, I, I think you've done a phenomenal job, really do. I think you've done the best job you could possibly do due to the circumstances. But it got me curious to know about the future with the association. Will you be with us in the next realignment? <laughs> yes. I will, I will be with you as we start this realignment, as we move forward. And just so you know, we actually have some legislators who are trying to, uh, you know, who, ha uh, who introduced a bill uh, because we had some schools that were not happy about where they ended up in the realignment. And there's a bill sitting out there that, uh, wow. you know, could uh, uh, disrupt all of that. But uh, all that being said, you know, I do not have any plans to retire right now. Um, you know, could I retire? Yes. But, you know, there's this little voice sitting on my shoulder. It's Charlie Adams who hired me back in 1991. And he's saying, do not go anywhere. They need you. Don't you leave them yet. <laughs> so, you That's know, right. so I plan to right. you know, be around for a little while. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I think it's very fitting that we all agree, as Sam said, that uh, Commissioner Tucker, that you are needed very much in these times and going forward for, to quote our good friend, Mr. Charlie Adams, smiling on us from above, for the boys and girls of North Carolina. <laughs> That's right. I think we all agree on that. So now that we're in a position where for all the things that we've said here this evening, the vaccine is a game changer. We're moving along into the spring and actually able to talk about games being played, which we couldn't do in August. But now that we're talking about games being played and for whatever hiccups there are with this football season, as there as we knew there would be, but we continue to persevere. So with games being played, with football going on now, football wise is it plausible and maybe advisable for all NCHSAA stakeholders to prepare for this spring's football state finals to be played on member schools campuses it is it is that is a great question um and i will tell you this um north carolina state university and the university of north carolina chapel hill want to host us. Uh, we have had conversation with them. Um, 
but you know there is this thing called graduation on college campuses <laughs> and they just get in our way <laughs> um, and this year with us playing football on um, may 8th there are many uh, of them that uh, you know, we're fortunate that NC State and UNC do not have graduation on that weekend. However, they are making preparations for graduation to be in their stadiums, which is it could be problematic as they look at building the platform for graduation and needing to access those facilities. So if we have rain, even though UNC has turf field, it could cause problems with the crew as they're trying to get in to build. And if we're taking up a couple of their days uh, when they would be building and now, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out what to do about that, that's problematic. So as we look at that, we're not dismissing the idea that we could play there. We are trying to find the right schools where we could play at the high schools. Uh, obviously, you know, football, very popular. People, you know, pe everybody loves football. I mean, you know, grandmas and grandpas, uh, you know, they may not come to basketball. They may not have been at lacrosse and soccer this past weekend, but a lot of these folks want to be at football. And so we'd love to be able to allow as many folk as we can. And those facilities have the capacity to accommodate the numbers we would have. So again, we're still in conversation with them, but we also are trying to figure out where we can go on a high school, in a high school facility where the grass will still look like, look a little bit like grass, um, knowing that we're gonna have some rain between now and May 8th. And so, you know, not everybody has a turf stadium. Now, if we were trying to play our state championships up in Asheville, Buncombe County, no, we could be in business because there are turf fields up there. So, so Alex, we're paying attention to all that. It's, it's very likely um, that, or I won't say likely, it's possible that we will have to play at a high school facility. And would you say that in that possibility that we would follow a paradigm of that central corridor like we did for basketball because of geographical ac accessibility for the majority of the state? We'd like to be able to do that. And obviously, and, and in fact, this was a conversation, a lengthy conversation we had just as a staff yesterday. Uh, you know, you, you, well, you could go, maybe you have a conversation with East Carolina. Uh, well, maybe you have a conversation with Campbell. But as we were on the internet looking at when their graduations are, so many of them have graduations at that same time. So it becomes a conflict. We thought about uh, over in Durham, you've got, you know, the stadium there, the city stadium, that's, a, they already have a conflict. Uh, North Carolina Central, it's graduation. a and not a turf field, but graduation in Aggieland. Um, Campbell, same thing, graduation. So we think the entire UNC system is all about graduation or leading into graduation around May 8th. So we'd like to stay along that corridor. Uh, we, we've taught, you know, two of the larger uh, football stadiums in the state are in Guilford County, uh, Jamison Stadium and then Simeon Stadium in High Point. Um, and so we, we haven't dismissed them, but we do know that, as I said, neither of those fields are turf. And, uh, you know, the wear and tear right now is pretty substantial. And will, will they hold up so that we would be able to play um, on those in those facilities on May 8th is the million dollar question. Hey Q, would they ever, um, would you guys ever consider UNC Charlotte, get, given its proximity, kind of in the middle of the state uh, from the east and the west? Yes. Now we and I'll be honest with you, Chris, we we did not pull up uh, UNC Charlotte. But as we were looking at the UNC system, we just saw that that the conflicts were all the way down the line in terms of that weekend. We did not pull them up. 
but we certainly will look. We certainly, yeah, absolutely, because if you remember years ago, we used to hold our state track meets over at UNC Charlotte. Now, the folks in eastern North Carolina, that was a haul for them. But, you know, we did it for several years. So it would not be out of the realm of possibility. Uh, we talked about Western Carolina. Uh, you know, we, we got kind of crazy yesterday in the office just trying to figure out where we could go. But, uh, you know, we, we're, we're on it and uh, we'll have something. I mean, we, we'd love to be able to be in, uh, you know, in Charlotte at Bank of America Stadium. Uh, that would be great. But we also know that they don't have turf field either. Um, and so, um, you know, I think their issues. grass is a different story, though, compared to other people's grass. Now, you're right about that. You're right about that. They work on that all the time. You got to give a shout out. Mike, Mike Newsom here, my mentor. Uh, uh, he's taught me a lot about football. I'm glad you're here, brother, man. Appreciate it. Mike, I wanted to ask you about Q. Uh, Q I'm, I'm sorry. So last week, uh, Chris and I attended a game in Shelby. Uh, and of course, this is a, for me, it's the first football game that felt like a football game because there were fans there. And mm -hmm. there was quite a large number of fans there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of brings up a question about the 50% capacity thing. Um, are you are you familiar with the game or uh the, the turnout, et cetera. No, um, you, you're getting ready to tell me something I didn't know. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just, I'm, I'm if you look, don't look know, at Mike, then, he's like, oh, don't tell, don't tell. Right, no, if you don't know, I'm not saying anything. But that's okay. Uh, I know how to look it up now. <laughs> but the question, uh, the, a question I do have, though, is, is you know, we, we were able to get more fans in and, um, we, you talked earlier about maybe us being able to get to 75%. Is that the next um, step from the 50% capacity, 75% that we're looking at? Uh, or did you just throw that number out? I just threw that out. I really do not have any kind of a direct line to Governor Cooper. I have no, that was just, I just threw that out. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't have any way of knowing. Um, it, and here's the frustration in all of this, is that uh, as we talked and people think that we don't advocate for our students, once we knew that the new executive order was coming into existence, going from 30% to something, we, we found out, yes, it was 50%. So my call to DHHS was, okay, now that we're going to 50%, do we have to keep the six feet distancing? How about three feet since the schools are opening up and if they're going back to plan A, meaning everybody is there, they certainly are not going to be able to get everybody in those classrooms and maintain six feet distancing. The answer I received was the executive order says three feet is permissible for schools and students, children, not for adults and not any place else. The six feet distancing still is in place and so that's what we had to honor. And that was not going to be something that I was going to have the ability to change DHHS or Governor Cooper. So would we be able to get more people in at 50% if we didn't, if we're, let me say, if we weren't supposed to have the six feet distancing? Do I believe that every school sta stadium is doing the right thing as it relates to the 50%? I won't say absolutely 100% I believe that because I have seen some pictures. But what I have seen is that if you look to the right or to the left of the screen when you're watching a game uh, on television or streamed, you see empty bleachers. You look in the middle of the bleachers and everybody seems to have, magnet, have like a magnet. They just kind of come together and the distancing is just not going to occur. And so the best we can hope for and the best thing we can do is to make sure that as they're sitting in those bleachers that they have the mask on properly uh, because we just simply would be the entire game trying to spread people out. And that's just probably an impossible task for administration. 
Um, so uh, if the Shelby game had seemingly more than 50%, um, which it sounds like maybe it did, uh, then, you know, that is concerning. And, uh, and as I said, when we first started, I think the ability to be able to start fall sports August 1 is very dependent on how we as adults uh, accept our responsibility and do the right thing. We cannot let our guard down, even if we've had the vaccine, even if we've had bo both shots, we still need to wear the mask. We still need to, you know, personal hygiene is important and we just still need to keep that distance. I'm, I'm convinced that that's the best way for us to get to a more normal 21-22 uh, school year. So Q, I'm gonna ask you one more thing and I think everybody on the panel here would agree with this. Uh, over the last few years and maybe the last decade, we've seen a decline in officiating. And it's because a lot of officials are leaving the uh, game and we're not having an influx of younger people to step in. And now I, I think this season we've seen some horrible results of that. So the question that I'd like to or, or the point I'd like to leave you with, is this something that the NCHSAA can address with their uh, funding? Because that's why officials aren't taking this up. It's uh, how much it costs to uh, one schools can't afford to pay officials, but so much. And uh, it's not really uh, advantageous for officials from a monetary point to uh, to be given their time. So I think that's one thing the NCHSA could help us with is officiating, improving the officiating of the game. And, and I'll make this real quick. We are addressing that. We've got several things that we will be talking with our board about as it relates to officiating. But for every new official who comes on board, we waive their registration fee. So we have had new blood come into the ranks this year. So that's one thing we do. But here's the key to it all. Good officials, not necessarily aging out, those good officials who are leaving officiating, they're not leaving because of the money. They're leaving because fans are obnoxious. Um, and that we, they, people just believe that officials are in it for the wrong reason. At the high school level, uh, they know they're not going to make the same amount of money that an ACC official does. They do it because they love the game and probably because they played or coached at some point in time. So I think that, yes, we'll continue to address it. We'll continue to look to see, are there some things that we can do to try to help? But keep in mind now that we can't just start saying, well, we're going to subsidize the pay of officials. The best we can do is to continue to find ways to give money back to our schools with the hopes that schools will use that money wisely. And so that when we do have officiating fee increases, that they will have the money to be able to pay uh, those officials. So it takes all of us, you know, that old saying, it takes a village uh, to raise a child. It takes a village really to have athletic programs. And, uh, you know, the NCHSA staff, we're just that, just the staff. We are the NCHSAA, and we've got to work together to try to improve officiating and to grow our numbers. I wholeheartedly agree, Q, and I think we are lucky in this state to have you, as Gary said earlier, and your staff helping our, our young boys and girls, as I like to say, of North Carolina. But I did hear you guys talking about state championships. There's a certain stadium in Kannapolis got brand new tape. <laughs> They, they, okay, well, good. Uh, we, do we need to uh, uh, somebody shoot me an email, give me a contact name, and uh, we certainly will, uh, you know, be happy to take a look. I, I see some folk have put some things out there saying we've got plenty of turf fields in Charlotte <laughs> and CMS. Uh, That's right. I don't know the size of some of those stadiums, but you know. Oh no, we got a big one in Kanapas. Hold on, okay. people down in Kanapas. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's let's take this opportunity right here, in the spirit of what Commissioner Tucker just said, to welcome the one and only Mr. Mike Newsom here among us <laughs> from Absolutely. the great city of Kanapolis That's with right. that beautiful stadium with that turf. And uh, Mr. Newsom, would you like to comment on this? <laughs> Well, we got to be able to hear you, though, Coach. We can't hear you. You're muted. 
No, he's not muted. He's going to have to log out come back in. But I'll say I was there in 1984 when A.O. Brown hosted the state championship game, and it was a big game against Tarboro. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, another, I mean, another thing Alex has talked about a lot is maybe having it in Panther Stadium. So maybe we need to get you and uh, Mr. Tepper together for a little lunch and maybe have it there. I know they were trying to have the Myers Park uh, South Point game was going to be the right. first game ever. It didn't work out because of COVID. But um, Q, I just want to, Coach, did you, did you get your microphone worked out? No, he didn't get it worked out. Log back, log out, and come back in. Log out and come back in. <laughs> but uh, Q, I want to thank you for coming on. Um, I, I feel so happy that we can have decision makers and, and come on the show. And you know, so many people talk about rumors and what they heard and what so and so said. It's nice to hear from the horse's mouth and give people the proper information. So, again, thank you for coming on. Um, you're always welcome on the show. Uh, let's see, Coach, do we have you now? You got me. All right, go ahead and make it, go okay, ahead and make so, it feel so, for Canapolis. So, so Mike, are you offering your stadium up? <laughs> I'm not the one that actually made it. <laughs> he uh, went. He you went. We need to. We lost you again, Coach. I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> we lost you again. Yeah. But, but Q, I'm going to let you go. Thanks for coming on with us. Enjoyed it as usual. Uh, we'll definitely have you on later on. I can ask you about your crystal ball again around July, August. Son. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank All you, right. guys. I really do appreciate thank what you, you guys do. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me because, as you say, it is nice to get it from the horse. And all of you know me. I'm going to tell you what I know. And if I don't know, I'm going to tell you I don't know. So yes, you absolutely. guys have a great have a great Easter. All right. You too. Thank you. You. Take care. All right. Take care. Bye bye. That's uh, Q Tucker with the association, the boss lady. Uh, Coach Newsom, do we have you now? I don't know. Yes. He keeps going. As soon as you say two happen? words, you cut out. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I can't hear you. But, we uh, heard him one word. <laughs> yeah, I heard one word, and then, then, he, then he went out again. But uh, we're going to go to Chris's corner. I'm going to take over the corner for one second, and I'm going to turn over to Chris. Let me find his theme music. All right, today, guys, we lost a legend in uh, Jim Odo, um, one of my favorite coaches of all time. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I knew he'd, he'd been ill. He was 85 years old. Uh, he left coaching at 77. You know, he always told me the coach, coaching kept him young. Taught me a lot about how to cover kids, uh, to be honest with you. He spent a lot of time with me. Uh, when I had my first my first son was born, he called me. Um, I'm going to get choked up. But I, Coach meant a lot, um, and I know he meant a lot to a lot of people. I asked uh, Bob Whitman of Charlotte Country Day, who played him over and over and over again in that Cook Cup game, to uh, to make some comments. And and uh, oh, they got you. You got your phone on now, man. Uh, am I working now? Yeah, now you're good. Let's turn it sideways. Turn it sideways. You're good. Um, but you know, Coach Coach just meant a lot. He taught you know taught everybody so much. And I asked Coach Whitman to make a couple comments because they played in that uh, Cook Cup game for 25, 30 years, and, and they were arch rivals, but really good friends. And here's what he had to say. I heard the sad news of the passing of Coach Jim Oda this morning, and I'd like to give my condolences to his family and the Charlotte Catholic community. Coach Oda was a great football coach. He was a great leader. He was an honest man. And uh, it, for me, it was an honor to play against uh, Charlotte Catholic Cougars particularly at Charlotte Catholic, what a great experience. Uh, Coach Odo and I, uh, our teams competed for the Cook Cup for 25 straight years uh, or more, and it, it was a great experience. He's a legend. His community is going to miss him, and I'm so proud to be uh, and so honored to be a, a part of that, at least a little bit, a little part of it. And uh, like I said, uh, the Charlotte community is going to miss him. Yeah, you meant, you know, uh, uh, Coach Newsom, I'm going to turn over to Chris, let him have it, but just your thoughts on, on, on Coach Odo. Man, uh, Coach Odo, what a, what a legend for our state and what an awesome guy for our whole football community. Um, you know, I only played against Coach Odo three times, one time as an assistant coach and two times as a head coach. Um, but I got to spend a whole year with him when, um, when we were coaching in the Shrine Bowl together. And I was able to talk to his wife the other day, and it, and it really, really made – it may have made my whole coaching career that, that she said that 
one of his highlights was getting to spend that time with us in the Shrine Bowl. And, and, and that time, we, we spent a lot of time together. It isn't just the week that you're at the Shrine Bowl, but leading up to the Shrine Bowl. And, and, and I got I, I told I called Kevin Christmas today at, at, at uh, Charlotte Catholic and just gave him uh, the whole whole Catholic community my condolences. But, um, you know, that, that time we got to spend together, I got Jim Odo stories that I'll that I'll tell forever because uh, he was just an awesome, awesome person. And he taught you more than football. I mean, I learned more uh, than, 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 than I could in a year from from him than I did for most people in my whole lifetime. Um, he is an awesome man, and I was glad to get to know him and his family uh, that, that year we got to spend together in the Shrine Bowl. Mike, I agree, and I had a chance to also, you know, working so well at the Shrine Bowl, and that was a great staff. We had Scott Young on that staff, I believe, and uh, Steve Davis. That was a great year and a lot of uh, great stories uh, with Coach Odo then and just throughout uh, my time in covered sports. Uh, so, you know, and I, Dale, I'm sure you had some – some interactions as well. So, you know, just our, our all, all of our heartfelt condolences to everybody and his players, people that's a school. I mean, I, I've got some calls from a lot of people who have certainly felt touched by him today. I um, had the privilege of working with Coach Odo on a number of levels as a journalist. And uh, I, uh, like Coach Newsom, I, uh, I corresponded with Kevin Christmas today and we exchanged some kind words and some good memories. I think back on just the inherent conviviality and welcoming nature of a gentleman who was at the top of his profession before any of us got to where we are in what we're doing and saw the opportunity and had the genuine desire to help show us the way and make what we were doing that much easier when there was nothing for him to gain from it except the privilege to show us the way and help us on our journeys and that was coach odo like coach newsom said i, I have many coach odo stories uh one that i remember for sure was when i interviewed him the week leading up to one of his state championship game appearances and he, he taught me a great lesson, which we can pass along to young people today. He spoke of going to a clinic many, many, many decades ago when uh, Tubby Raymond uh, introduced him to the wing T offense. Uh, and so that was decades ago when uh, Coach Raymond was at the University of Delaware. And Coach Odo had been coaching well over 30 years at Charlotte Catholic but, uh, by that point in time and still was running the wing T. So the fact that he could take something uh, that had its origins in earlier generations of the game and um, teach it and impart the fundamentals of that game to young men who transcended multiple generations and show how that same concept can be effective in the way that it was effective when he coached the fathers of a lot of these young men with whom he won state championships in the early 2000s. And to pass that from one generation to the next shows his content efficacy and his instructional efficacy. Uh, that carried over in his formation of young men who carried on his educational mission as evidenced by the likes of Mr. Reeves McGloughan, who played for Coach Odo when Coach Odo coached at East Mecklenburg. Mr. McGloughan went on to a very successful 40-year career in education, including a nearly eight-year tenure as Gaston County School Superintendent. So a former, a, one who forms young men was Coach Odo's legacy. So all of those things, and to do all of them within a faith and mission driven framework, always seeking to bring others along and help make their journeys that much more easier and enjoyable defines the legacy of Jim Odo. And I'm grateful that he took the time to show me the way in so many ways. 
And Chris, yeah, I, I had a lot of interactions with him, uh, obviously being here in Charlotte. And uh, I think my first uh, interaction with him was kind of striking in that I was a little intimidated being, you know, going down on the sidelines as, a, as an unknown individual pretty much. And that's kind of what he said to me was, you know, he, he knew a little bit about what I was doing, but uh, his comment, you know, he, him to come up to me and me not have to go up to him. Yeah. And to talk with me about what I was doing, and it just kind of drives the point that the man was a good man. Yes, and he cared about the game. He cared about youth. He cared about uh, moving youth forward. And and I, I just don't I don't think you could come across too many people like him. That his um, his ethics his um, uh, his love of what he did uh, and why he did it. And, you know, it, it, it used to be, and it still is, people would say that, you know, Jim Moto's uh, Catholic football team. Um, and I'm sure that many people there today still think that, uh, you know, that's his, uh, that's his legacy. Agreed. Oh, great uh, conversation remembering um, Coach Odo. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about the big games uh, for this upcoming week. we got Coach Newsom to, to talk about them. Uh, we're going to touch on your game. I know you've got a very big one on the road Friday night, or is it th I guess it's Thursday night, Coach, uh, going up at J.M. Robinson. Uh, Bulldogs are 5-0. I caught your game last week against South Mech. I, I didn't get a chance to see you, uh, but South Mech's really, really good, by the way. Uh, but tell us a little bit about this big game coming up Thursday. Well, uh, Chris, you know, you and I have talked about when you come to our game, some some, some reason the Wonders don't play well. So <laughs> I, I saw a picture of you there afterwards. Somebody showed me something or I saw some picture of you in the in the press box. And I said, that's the reason why we didn't play well. Nah, but South Mech is a good football team. They're the most they're, they're the most underrated uh, now two and three football team on the, in the state of North Carolina. They got some they got some talent. Um but this game, yeah, this this is for the marbles of the of the conference here this week. This is, uh, you know, we, we got a big game against J.M. Robinson, and, and J.M. Robinson, you know, I think with the opening up of West uh, of West Cabarrus, really a lot of people didn't have J.M. Robinson on on their map uh, as far as being a contender this year, and I think that's made those those jokers play like, uh, you know, play like some dogs backed into a corner. You know, when you a dog backed in the corner, it bites you. So, uh, you know, they're they're. Uh, they're playing really good football. They've got some great athletes. I think uh, uh, Coach uh, Robinson was able to get some uh, players out that that hadn't been played in the past, and maybe some athletic guys that played basketball or something. Um, and uh, you know, he's done a great job of getting those guys prepared to play. There's two former wonders that coach on that team, and uh, you know, they've they've got a a, a really good football squad. And, and we're going to have to do everything we can do going up to J.M. Robinson and and to go in there and try to get a win. Well, good luck, Coach, and we appreciate you coming on. Uh, Dale, we got a huge one going on in Charlotte Friday night, or Thursday night, I guess, with everything being moved up in Huff, I mean, in Providence and Olympic, two undefeated teams. Uh, give us your thoughts on this huge match matchup. So it, it is huge, and uh, Providence has been in this situation a number of times of being in kind of a driver's seat situation for conference championship. And under uh, Barry Shuford, Olympic was, uh, but yet Olympic only won one conference championship during that span, and that was in 2009. And when I look at this game, I see a team that's you know in very similar situation as that 2009 team. Mm -hmm. uh, this is huge. This this had built to be a pretty decent rivalry back in the uh, middle, uh, say 2004, five, six time frame. Um, and for these two teams to, I think, uh, be playing for what will be the conference championship, I think Olympic has, has got a an easy road after this. Uh, so yes. I think it's a big game for both, Chris. It's it, it's huge for both. Huge and we'll set the road, yeah. Hey, let's stay in Charlotte real quick, Dale. We got another big one in undefeated Huff hosting a two-loss Mallard Creek game, but I still think that's a huge game. And then we'll shift forward to Myers Park and Porter Ridge as well. Uh, Dale, hit us up with Huff and Mallard Creek first. Man, you know, this is – how many times do these two teams face each other and Huff is the favorite? And uh, maybe – 
some go ahead i'm sorry yeah go ahead well uh, no I'm, I'm agreeing with you yeah. but i don't know that mallet creek is nothing there i think i've seen this mallet creek team i think that they've i ain't gonna say they'll go out and win the ball game but i don't think this is a mallet creek team you overlook if you're coach matt jenkins well i don't think you gotta you overlook them because there's a rivalry here uh there's a uh, and how much of that rivalry has carried over from the few times that huff was able to nick uh, Mallard Creek in the past, and are they going to be a little too confident would be one of the things I would worry about is coming into this game more confident and then they're able to play, and Mallard Creek uh, certainly has uh, chips on their shoulder and things to prove. So a good, I, I think a potential yeah. of a good game. I think I think so as well. You know, uh, Butler and Myers Park and Hickory Ridge have all kind of beat up on each other, and you've got four and one Porter Ridge sitting there uh, finally waiting their chance to play one of them. Uh, what do you see in this game? Man, uh, it's another test for uh, uh, Myers Park. Myers Park has come through on yeah. all of their tests, right? They've, they've yep. played very well. But this is another one of those teams that's kind of like a Weddington. They're very uh, sound in their uh, fundamentals yes. of the game. Um it's not going to be a cakewalk for Myers Park. I don't Not at all. That. Not at all. Alex, so last week, Rollsville finally got past the, the hump of beating the Wake Forest team. Beat them soundly 36-3. to uh, They got another big game uh, this week in Heritage. Uh, what's your thoughts up there in the triangle? Rollsville has to win this game. Here's why. Yes, I know they're undefeated, but Rollsville still has to win this game in terms of having a breakthrough campaign. We've all been in situations with teams statewide when we hear, oh, this, this is the year this team can get it done. This team looks great on paper. This team is doing this. This team is doing that. Kind of the effect back in the early 2000s with Garner and Southeast Raleigh. Everyone talked about Southeast Raleigh. Had never answer, beat Garner. The answer was beat Garner and, and then – beat Garner, go undefeated in the conference, and then come talk to us. Yes, Rollsville absolutely. is in that situation right now. Southeast Raleigh never did that. I, I guess we can give them a pass on the 2003 season when Garner nicked them in the regular season, yeah. but then Southeast won the playoff game. We'll give them that. But, but other than that, it never happened. Rollsville is in that situation here. You get over the hump versus Wake Forest. Congratulations. Yeah. Now you have to take the next step versus a very good heritage team, obviously to make progress, but also that both the Wake Forest and Heritage games are at Rollsville. Rollsville won at home against Wake Forest and Rollsville will welcome Heritage. Yes. So at so truly for Rollsville, if not now, then when? No, you're right. But here, here's the thing, and I'll say this about Rollsville. They're still very junior heavy. Quarterbacks are junior, Byron Brown. I think they're still a year away from being the dominant team they're going to be. Uh, but And I just want to throw one other big game in the Raleigh area out. Cleveland 5-0. Uh, they're going to um, host West Johnston, who's also 5-0. West Johnston probably had their name reached or uh, talked about on the air in a while. Uh, great for that program at West Johnston. Um, Alex, I, I mean, Langston, I think we're going to roll up the – Raleigh Durham Sweet 16 right now. So let's go ahead and hit it. Uh, as you've seen, Alex, we just talked about Rollsville coming in at number one. Uh, Cardinal Gibbons, and they jumped Cardinal Gibbons, by the way. Cardinal Gibbons still 4 0. Cleveland had that big win over Clayton, 34 uh, 27 game. Heritage, obviously the number 14 playing Rollsville. Apex Friendship, uh, they're going to go play a 4 and 1 Milbrook team this week. Big game. Uh, Wake Forest is still in the mix. Clayton, Southern Durham, uh, they're 5 and 0. They play 3 and 1 Chapel Hill this week. You got Milbrook, Panther Creek. Panther Creek's going to play a big one against Pittsburgh Northwood. Uh, keep that one on your radar. Uh, Middle Creek, Princeton, Holly Springs, Leesville Road, West Johnston, and Fuquay. Uh, and you got some good teams down there as well on the bubble. So uh, there you see some pretty solid football teams still in the Raleigh area. And oh, yeah, I think very good football here and the uh, uh, Roseville jumping Cardinal Gibbons. I think we can say and, and, and people will, will speak both ways about that. Roseville did have an impressive win, but it's also an opportunity to note the outstanding play that we're seeing from both Roseville and from Cardinal Gibbons and Cardinal Gibbons, particularly on the defensive side of the ball. We're seeing great work from the Crusaders. Uh, 
defense. We looked at Malcolm Reed last week uh, and the Crusaders secondary. And a, that's a real testament to the work of Cardinal Gibbons defensive Absolutely. coordinator and assistant head coach Nick Drew, one of the st uh, top up and coming defensive coordinators in the state of North Carolina. So a tremendous job that coach Drew is doing in uh, taking the Crusaders defense to yet a higher level one season removed from a championship game appearance. So we're seeing good things. Roseville, Cardinal Gibbons, Cleveland, that's all right there at the top yeah. in that bunch as, as it should be. And great job of uh, getting the assistant coach's name out there. Uh, Langston, let's take a look uh, before we go on to the second Sweet 16, 17 through 32 here uh, in the Charlotte Observer region. Uh, Lake Norman right there at the top, three and two. Mallard Creek, uh, again, these are very solid teams. Watonga coming in at 4-0. Hickory Ridge, Robinson's 5-0. They got that big game against A.L. Brown. Porter Ridge, A.L. Brown, Mount Pleasant, R.S. Central, Statesville, Ash County, Thomas Jefferson, Pine Lake Prep 5-0. Uh, by the way, I've really done a lot of digging into Pine Lake Prep, uh, and they are for real. There's no question about that. Uh, Bunker Hill Chase, Monroe, uh, some of these teams are playing against each other. You see the teams that dropped out. And we got some really solid bubble teams as well down there. Uh, so all in all, I think this just shows you, I mean, we're about 40 teams deep right here in the Charlotte area. And it, I think it just shows how strong football is in this region. And I think why this show is so popular. Well, you still, you still got Valley Creek outside the pole, man. They're, they're not they're not liking us too much of it right now. <laughs> not liking us too much right now. We got Chris back later with the Charlotte Sweet 16. And uh we're gonna get it. I gotta let Alex go too. We'll have Alex back as well. All right, we got Jack Curtis, my man from Audrey Kell. How you doing? How you doing, Mr. Ross? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, man. You gonna beat Sam, right? Yes, sir. I'm gonna try. I'm tired of Sam being undefeated. I'm tired of it. I feel like that's – why does everybody hate on G over here? We want you to Jack, lose, man. Yeah, we, Sam, Sam is undefeated. He's got to go down. Jack, Jack looks like he's ready right now, though, because he did some push-ups before he got <laughs> you know, Jack, over Jack, there. before we get started, man, tell us about the season you guys have in Audrey Kell. That was a crazy game in the Olympic game of the year. I know you guys came up short, but you proved you could play with anybody. Talk about the season and where you guys are headed right now. Yeah, our season been going well. Um, our seniors have been playing great. You know, for them, this is their uh, third head coach in three years. That doesn't show for them. Um, our defense is really sound this year. Uh, the biggest thing for us this year has just been uh, letting our playmakers play. Uh, my lines been giving me a lot of time to throw the ball, uh, more time than I need, to be honest. Um, and once I get the ball to my receivers and uh, to our backs, they just do what they do. Uh, our defense hasn't let up that many points, and we've put up a lot of points this year. Um, I think we're averaging probably about 35 points a game, and for us, that's not enough. We, we always got to try to do more. Yeah, now this week Olympic and Providence are playing, but you got Providence next week, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so that, that game could be for a conference championship, depending on what happens this week. So that's going to be really well, interesting. And who gets to the playoffs? And like, Well, yeah, because only two teams are guaranteed. But I would imagine that if somebody comes out of there with one loss, maybe even two losses, they, they'll get a shot. But it's going to be interesting. We had Miss Tucker on earlier, and she was saying that they're not going to change the formula. So there's going to be some teams with two losses that don't get to go to playoffs. It's just, exactly. just what's going to happen. So, Jack, you understand the rules. We're going to ask you a multiple-choice question. You pick the answer. And you, beat Sam, and you beat Sam. And you beat Sam. Are we running his tape earlier or no? Oh, well, I, yeah, I, I didn't. You know, I didn't load it. I'm sorry. I didn't load your tape. My bad. But I put it on Twitter. So if you saw it on Twitter, I did load Sam talking about you. Yeah, I think, dude, I'm going to be honest with you, man. Your skill set impressed me a lot. Not a lot of quarterbacks just overwhelm me and impress me. You did a phenomenal job getting the ball out. Like, you remind me of a shortstop, second baseman. I mean, you just you, – you don't have to do much and you're throwing an accurate ball and it's coming out fast. That gives your athletes half a second to a full second more time to make plays for you. And I just – I think that's a great attribute, man. You're doing a good job. Thank you, Coach. Yeah, yeah man. That's my, that's my bad, Jack. I'm supposed to have your highlights up. We're supposed to drop them so everybody can see it. But I put it on Twitter again uh, tomorrow. So everybody – it's on Twitter now. I put it out again. I put it on Instagram and Facebook. I put it everywhere so people can see it. But, but here we go. We got, the first, we got the first question. Dale is up. <laughs> Kids, he's crazy, these questions. Dale is up. Here we go. Okay. So uh, what song does Hannah Montana sing to show that she's really Miley Cyrus? A in the movie. It's very important. It's in the movie because she reveals it multiple times in the show. This is the okay. movie part. Okay. 
A, the climb. That really helps me, by the way. Yeah, it really helped me, too. <laughs> B, you will always find your way back home. C, party in the USA. D, the best of both worlds. I'm waiting to hear this answer. Me, too. I didn't watch much Hannah Montana. Um, I didn't either, brother. So you <laughs> yeah, I'm just, just like, oh, God. Not dark, coach. If you did, we'd have a little, we have another discussion we'd have to. If you been <laughs> this uh, movie is iconic. I'm going to say, it's take my entire life. I'm going to say D, best of both worlds, because she goes like two, pe two people, I'm pretty sure. All right. What you guys say? I'm going to say A, the climb. How does he do this? How did you do that? How did uh, you do that? Just let, hey, I don't watch that show. Just letting you know. I, I know. It's I, the movie. How did how did you do that, Sam? How that was, did you do that? that Tell the easy. truth. That was the easy one. All right, Sam's up. Easy or did you just guess because it was? The I'm not going to tell you. I think I don't know the You go to Google when we ask these questions. Yeah, he's got his phone down there. I think there's something you're doing down there. All right, Kizzy, Kizzy, question two. On the '70s show Good Times, what did Michael want to be when he grew up? A, a doctor, B, a mayor, C, a judge, or D, an architect? Sam. Oh, my. Sam. Wow. Yeah, I know. It's on me. Let me think for a second. Let me see both your hands. Yes, hands up. Guys, are you, are, you serious? are you really serious right now? <laughs> <laughs> I just no, the stuff that You're messing up my uh, zen right now, too. All right. All right. All right. It is a live show. Yes, I know. Well, we're gonna have to wait a second because my, you know, reputation's on the line right here. Um, I'm not. Dang, I don't want to do this, but I'm gonna say D. Aren't you? Yeah. All right, what you got, Jack? Uh, I say I think a lot of people want to be a doctor. A doctor's a pretty good profession. I'm gonna say A. Uh, you both got it wrong. He wanted to be Judge Mathis. Ah, okay. So we're, 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 we're one and oh and one. Let me let me make I gotta write it down because Sam accused me of cheating. Yeah, uh, one zero. <laughs> one oh and one. All right, uh Dale, you're up. Okay. What is the name? What is the name of the website that uh high school seniors can use to fill out college applications? A app.net, B get into school, C Common app, D, College Board. Jack, you're up first. Uh, I'm going D, College Board. I'm setting a paper on that right now. Yeah, it's it's definitely D. Kizzy, what's the answer? Okay, it's it's C. What? Jack, you may want to know what? this one for the future. It's, it's C. Common app you used to apply to college. College Board is another, like, website. So that's what you use to take AP exams. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm, no I'm, one I'm, likes the college board. Right Common app is your friend. Unbelievable. Kenzie's been going through this, so I know she knows it's right. All oh, right, yeah, Kenzie. You, Kenzie, you're up. Now, I didn't know the answer to this question. What is famous rapper gave Busta Rhymes his stage name? A, Dr. Dre, B, Jay-Z, C, Eminem, or D, Chuck D? I'm getting uh, It's on me. I know, I know two of them are not it. Look uh, into the screen. Don't look down. I'm not looking down, man. Come on, guys. Eyes up, up, eyes forward. Eyes forward. forward. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm gonna go with uh, D. Chuck B. All right, Jack. Uh, either we both get it right, or you both get it wrong. I'm, I'm gonna say D as well. You both got it right. All right. So all as right. we go to our last question. I'm on one. Is one, is one uh, yes, it, it, we're all, well, Sam's up one ultimately. So as we go to our yeah. last question, Sam's up one. And Dale, you have our final question on a show I really like, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on the TV show All American, Spencer writes a paper on his football, uh, on football uh, player that inspired him. Who is it? Emmett Smith, A, B, Champ Bailey, C, Bo Jackson. D. Deion Sanders. I got to do more homework the next time I come out here. 
<laughs> Kenzie came up with some good questions. She did. She, she did. She did up with good questions. Thank you. Well. So what you got, Jack? Uh, I'm gonna go with D. Neon Dion. Neon Dion. What you got, Coach? Uh, B. Champ Bailey. Oh no, you got it wrong. We got a tie, but I couldn't Ooh, get you beat. Yeah. I got you. He, he's like two zero and two now. Mm-hmm. I'm time. So Never we're, we're, we're gonna. No. No. <laughs> we're still players. But Jack, man, thanks for coming on, man. We enjoyed you. Um, hopefully, you guys can make a nice playoff run. What's your college recruitment looking like right now? Well, as of right now, I'm talking to some Ivy League coaches, uh, Columbia, Dartmouth, uh, Princeton. Uh, okay. Going uh, to a good academic school is high on my uh, resume as I'm trying to, um, you know, be a good, a good fall player, but even a better student. Um, uh, ultimately, uh, I, whoever offers me is, is going to get uh, is going to get me. I just want to have a chance to sh show what I can do. Yeah, what you do? I you're a great leader, man. I can see how your players get excited for you when you make plays. That's that's a that's big time for you, man. Really, how is your athleticism? I I didn't see that. Are you are you like you can burst a little bit? You can run. Uh, yes, sir. And I break the pocket. Um, I, I actually had quite a bit of uh, running yards this year. Um, nice. Unfortunately, our star back uh, blew uh, blew his knee, so um, I'm starting to um take a little bit more of a running role. Uh, okay. so those RPOs or uh run passes for me. Um, so we'll see how the season goes and in, in the playoffs. Sounds good, brother. I tell you what, man. Anybody goes to the, wants to go to Ivy League is going to end up doing well nine times out of ten. So best of luck to you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for all support. You know, make sure you tell all your friends to watch Talking Preps every Monday night at eight o'clock. I sure will. Thank you, Coach. All right, man. Take care, sir. Excellent. That's a good young man right there. We got we got a lot of good young people. I mean, we we talk to Kenzie every week, so we know she's a good young person. We got a lot of dad was complaining when I picked the same thing he did because I like Dion too. I was like, I'll go with the other one because I knew if I got it wrong, it wasn't gonna make him take the lead. So I, was like, I don't know how you do this every week. It's like I'm very impressed with the Hannah Montana. I yeah, must I mean, say, I'm very really disappointed in Jack, but I'm very impressed. It's, it's, it's like really, it's like really beyond me how you do this every week. But but you, 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 you get this question, y'all be kicking out Google stuff. Y'all are silly, man. I tell you, like silly. Google it. <laughs> All right, it's time for Grice's gems. We don't have a Grice, but we got an Alex. Here we go. All right, Mr. Bass, we're going to hopefully make this work this week. Let's see if I have the magic touch. Here we go. Here we go, Mr. Xavion Coulter of Newton Conover. 20 tackles, two for loss in the Red Devils, 27-16 win over North Lincoln. Very, very important game in, in that conference always with uh, Newton Conover, North Lincoln, and uh, Lincolnton. So that battle right there, always very important. 20 tackles. Two tackles for loss. This is a man on a mission to keep the Red Devils in the hunt and a conference win they needed. Right, let's go to Providence and Connor Drake. Not since Orlando Pace has there been such popularity and admiration for the term pancake block. Mr. Drake had 10 of those blocks and a 47 nothing win over Harding. Moving right along to Mount Pleasant. Undefeated with Ryan Tyson and Bryce Parker. And you look for an 80-yard touchdown pass connection on the 39 to 12 win over Forest Hills, keeping Mount Pleasant five and zero. Oh. Now, as I said previously, you, you you need not look once, twice, and let alone thrice to realize I am not Jonathan Grice. <laughs> I did. Well, you but, did it a lot faster than Grice does. Grice gets his heavy. I, I, I ain't gonna lie. I was impressed with Alex segment segment right there because he he rolled like I was like okay. Yeah, he got he, he got through it, but it's it's Kenzie time for so me and Austin. What's up, Kenzie? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing real good. Doing real good. I I tell you what, the Hannah Montana question was legit question right there. That was, I mean, that was, I'm gonna be on it. That you came up with it. I did because Hannah Montana really just shaped me as a person. Nice. Like that and Wizards of Waverly Place, like, you know, like Selena Gomez and Miley Cyrus. More Selena Gomez now, Miley, you know, she's a good person, but we just kind of have different personalities. Mm -hmm. um, but they definitely shaped me um, in the person I am, those characters. Um, Travis, you know, really shaped what I look for in a man. 
just you know just big time you know great stuff that's good so, yeah, i had to throw it in there 15 years of hannah montana i mean i still live my life off of rocky movies and stuff so oh, <laughs> it's, like it's a little different but <laughs> I hear you. all right well who's your interview this week you know, it's Audrey Kell night. You know, we got Travis Collins of Audrey Kell. He's a really good player. Uh, his brother reached out to me. Um, just, you know, all around good guy. I'm good. Let's check the film. Travis Collins, a senior linebacker at uh, Audrey Kell. Travis, you and your team have had a pretty successful start um, with a big win over South Mech to start the season. How are you guys hoping to build on that momentum? Yeah, uh, we just definitely have to keep the energy going each week during practice, going into game day. Um, we need guys that are going to step up that want to play eventually, and we all want to win, so – should be, uh, we should keep this streak going. Yeah. And in a year where we face such uncertainty with COVID and all that, how have you embraced your role as a senior and what's come with that leadership? Uh, yeah. So I'm not much of a verbal leader, but I definitely like to lead by example. And um, I want these guys to like see me, how I act, um, how hard I work. And I want to set the bar high for them. So next year when they start playing, they have um, higher expectations for themselves. Yeah. Now it's a little bit more fun. We've got a speed round here for you, Travis. What's your favorite movie? Transformers. What's your favorite TV show? Family Guy. What's your favorite food? Cheeseburger. What's your favorite color? Green. Who's your favorite singer or band? Shine Down. And if you were a superhero, who would you be? Superman. Sweet. Travis, it was great talking to you. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you. How about, how about Kenzie looking fresh in the video? Wow. Yeah. yeah, you look great, Kenzie. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. He wasn't a bad looking fella either, you know. I'm like, all right. You trying you try to like you, you trying to play a dating game or something? Right. New game show. Got a new mix match all right here. Yeah, uh, I see. All right. Time for rest faces. I don't have Grice. Maybe Grice is why I can't get this right. Maybe. Maybe. work. Kenzie. <laughs> Dimitri Kelly of Myers Park. Uh, he's a junior, 3.5 GPA. He's a ball hawk. He's going to get to the ball really fast, uh, really quick out of the breaks. He's like 5'11", 175. He'll get bigger, though. Um, he's had one in, couple interceptions, force tackle. Um, he, he's just a really great player, really coachable. Um, there's a lot of upside to him when he uh, – with practice and stuff. Yeah, I mean, what do you think, Sam? What are you seeing right here? Yeah, the guy the guy can play. He's got a good first step. He's got a good tee stick. You see when he sticks, a lot of times he puts his heel on the ground. That's like a lost art form these days, and I think it's still the best way to break downhill. I can see that he's doing that very well. He's mm -hmm. being coached up pretty good. All right, so we got uh, Gary. Xavier Brower. Uh, lefty quarterback at Mallet Creek. Uh, how'd you like your first start your first two games out against the likes of state champion Vance and always tough Lake Norman team? Uh, didn't play bad in those games, but since then he's led Mallet Creek to three straight wins. Sam, you played against him. What do yeah. you think about him? I think, like I said, he's a great leader for his team. He does a really good job. I met him this summer a little bit. Um, told him he needed to come to West Charlotte. Just kidding. <laughs> he, uh, no, he makes the best. He makes the best pre-snap 
decisions. And I think that's one of his greatest attributes when he plays quarterback. He knows what he's doing with football before he takes the snap. He's able to read the defense, and he makes quick decisions, and that helps him a lot. Yeah, I think Molly Creek, if they get to the playoffs, it's going to be a team that nobody really wants to deal with. Get to that end zone, young fella. There you go. Yeah. yeah. That's a uh, tough way to start the season now. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, they, 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 were, they had four starters coming back and have to play that way, and, you know, now they're getting their sea legs, and they could be a problem. They still have talent, they still have size. And they got a lot of kids coming back. Yeah, true. <laughs> you know what I'm so you, you you not what you said you're not looking forward to that Sam. All right, we got uh, Chris is up. All right, Javon McIver is a great defensive player. There you see him going stride for stride um, there at a corner. Uh, he is a defender who I think has a lot of speed, but he also has a lot of toughness, which is something you don't always see uh, from a corner defender. And, and, you know, he has played very well despite the fact that, that Rocky River has played, you know, the, the Notre Dames and Clemson's and Ohio State to the high school football schedule. This team has not had a break. They're finally going to play Indy this week, and I think he's got a chance to shine. Uh, I like the speed. I like the, the, the overall football GPA or the football uh, wherewithal that he has. There you see him right Right there, I love the way he turns the hips right there to get into to, to get in that coverage. I mean, that is great natural instincts. He's got a toughness, and, and his head coach and Lanny Gray was one of the toughest defenders I've ever seen in my high school days. And I think he plays with that same kind of swagger. So I'm looking forward to seeing him as he continues to get better. He's a tall boy too. He, he really is six two, about one seventy five, maybe. Yeah, that's whoa, good looking ball player. He has Absolutely. a good three-step good looking throw. All right, Gary, quarterback time. Evan Bernard, Cupperson High School. Um, six foot, six one, about 190. Great athlete. Uh, watch him move around, and he's very accurate on the run. Right here, you can see his athletics right. getting into the third level of the Ooh. defense. Okay, young fella. He knows some nice moves. <laughs> I love that that yellow top blue bottom combination. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I like he sticks that he sticks that back foot down and he lets it go. That means he's doing his pre snap reads. He knows where he's going with the ball when that back foot hits. Uh, Evans, uh, we got a, a nomination for you to be on Kinsey Time, so you need to reach out. Oh, he's already been on there. Oh, he's been on there already. Okay. Oh, he's yeah, been well. on Kinsey Time. Okay. Look, look how he slides in the pocket. He that just doesn't nice. take out nice. front of him. On this particular play, is a rollout, but very yeah, he, active. He looks, he looks really good. Dale, we're going to go down to uh, the standard in South Mac. The standard. Let me tell you, you know, when I when I watched this kid the first time, I kept thinking to myself, basketball things. He's long. He's got a big wingspan. Of course, he's a basketball player, but he's quick. He's got big size, 6'4". Um, I don't know if at the next level he's going to be a hands-in-the-dirt guy. He, he could be a TE or something, but – Seems to have good speed, decent strength, and man, is he! He look at that reach. He, 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 he a reach. He one hundred percent going to be a defensive end. They make way more money down the road than. Yeah, he's good though. I like him. Yeah, he yeah. is good. I, it, six four, like he's six four, legit. He ain't gonna have no problems getting into school. He he's in the low two hundreds. I think it's two two fifteen, two twenty ish, somewhere in that range. But that right that first right there, that's different, right? There. He's got some speed, yeah, and that reach, man. All right, Alex, let's go to Union County. Braden McAllister, Porter Ridge High School. A kicker can score only when the holder places the ball. When the holder places the ball. Put the ball through the upright. 17 out of 19 extra points, just below 90%, and one of one field goals getting the job done. You can only put the ball through the uprights when the ball is placed there by the holder. How important is that? 30 years ago, there was a reason that the San Francisco 49ers didn't win a third straight Super Bowl. They lost in the NFC Championship, not to the Cowboys, but to the Giants. And why, did they lose to the, and why did they lose to the Giants? A kicker, Matt Barr, hit a field goal as time expired. Kickers returnable kicks. kicks. Kickers can get things done, and kickers make good money. And Mr. Barr helped the Giants win a championship ring. Yeah, there's a lot of kickers from around here just playing college well, football, football and in Super Bowls. I mean, we got yep. that day in order kicking thing is really working out. 
Well, yeah. Porter Ridge has produced a number of kickers. Absolutely. Sam, let's go up to Richmond County. Yeah, Mr. Lindsay right here. He, I was watching him on kickoff, and I was like, okay, this man plays kickoff. See, a lot of these starters that play outside linebacker, they don't want to be on kickoff. But he does a great job of shrugging off the, um, the guy that's trying to block him and make that. That's a hard job to do on kickoff. Now, in their scheme, it looks like he's that 4-2-5. He's that rover. He can play into the flats. He can – he can play the run. He can do a lot of different things. So he must be very versatile, and uh, you could see that. But, like, this right here, that's that's my favorite thing right there. Coming off, make the block, makes a great tackle. You got you can't beat that. You need guys that can make plays in open space, and he looks like he's very comfortable in open space for sure. Yeah, Richmond County has a lot of guys that can play football again like they always do. Um, Sam, I, I, I swear, man, with a little polish, you know, I, I, we can make you into a John Gruden type of dude calling football games on a Saturday just with a little bit of polish there. <laughs> I, I really, I really be, if you ever, you ever get sick of get sick of coaching high school football, I know you got a job in front of you. All right, it's time to go back to the corner. Let's see who's in the sweet 16. Let me find your theme music, Chris, and we'll find it out. All right, guys, let's do it. Um, got some uh, big time teams here in the Charlotte Observer Sweet 16 for this week. Uh, we'll start there at the bottom. Uh, number 16, Burns, uh, four and one. Burns has a huge game on Friday night, by the way. They are playing uh, the number nine, ranked, ninth ranked Crest team, uh, Maiden undefeated. Wow. Ardrick Kell, four and one. I got to give a shout out to Ardrick Kell. They're driving up the mountain to Asheville to take on 5 0 AC Reynolds Friday night. So, huge, huge game for Ardrick Kell. Providence, uh, we, we've discussed them quite a bit. Uh, that team just continues to go up, 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 and up. I think the last time they were 5 0 was, I think, 2009 under Coach Randy Long. Uh, Shelby, 4 and 1. Uh, Dale and I had a chance to see them. They're still a pretty good football team. Uh, High Brighton, 5 0 undefeated. Uh, Olympic, uh, well discussed. I think that team is like going up with a bullet. Um, Charlotte Catholic, uh, three and one. You know they they've kind of been one of the teams that's been affected by the COVID, missing a few games because of their opponents. Uh, they play I think on Monday next week. Um, Kings Mountain, we saw them. What a game uh, Saturday night. Uh, that team is really really strong. Uh, Butler, uh, we. We've mentioned them. Uh, Coach Brian Hills thinks that could be one of his best Butler teams ever, uh, especially since the championship run. Uh, Wannington at four, Richmond at three. Uh, Richmond's not going to play a game the rest of the regular season. Uh, so I don't know what that's going to do with Richmond in these rankings. Uh, we heard Q Tucker say, we, I'm, I'm still pretty sure they're going to go in as the number one seed out of their conference. Uh, but three and oh, Richmond. Huff at five and oh, obviously they, they've got a huge challenge Monday. Uh, the Thursday night against Mallard Creek and Vance. I think Vance is just Vance, and, and they just, to me, look like they're on a different level. Uh, uh, what what you think, guys? Keep Chris here a second. Don't let him run away. Chris, when you left uh, Saturday night, it rained for about three to five minutes, and then we were good the rest of the game. What a – what a – I had to listen to a part of it on the radio until I ran out of range, and then obviously – I hear you. I, you I think from what we saw – Kings Mountain uh, looks to be – they're thin in numbers, but – Very man, thin. They, they are good. They are good. That quarterback – Ethan Reed Shelby, special. Uh, Kenzie, that's somebody you should talk to. I, I really thought that kid played well, uh, the quarterback for uh, Shelby. So yeah, maybe. Maybe. Get him in. Let's get him on. <laughs> maybe. Well, we need we we need to get a golden lion on the program to atone for the Sweet Sixteen omission from a That's couple right. of weeks ago. So, uh, so, 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 Kenzie, if you want to help out Langston on that one, I'm sure he'll appreciate it. <laughs> that kid, man. And good evening once again. What we all know is one's got to go. And here we are. So let's get right to it. I know it's late at night, but it's always good to have breakfast. We don't have to wait till tomorrow morning to have breakfast. We could have some breakfast biscuits right now. So what are we going to have and what are we getting rid of? Bojangles, Hardee's, Chick-fil-A, or McDonald's? What's going, Kenzie? Well, you got to keep Chick-fil-A. I mean, that's unbeaten. I mean, ooh. 
I didn't even know McDonald's had a biscuit. <laughs> but, but I feel like Hardee's would just be gross. <laughs> so I'm probably going to get rid of Hardee's just out of interpretation. Kenzie, we've always known you to be very, very sharp. You just proved it yet again. <laughs> All right, Gary. Uh, Bo Jangles has got to go. And here's why. Their biscuits are going downhill. They're they're so inconsistent. You know, sometimes you get a soft one. Sometimes you get one that just crumbles. And if you're supposed to be in the, the business of biscuits, which they are, biscuits and chicken, and your biscuits are not always good, then you got a problem. The other three, you know, they specialize in something else. Burgers, chicken sandwiches. So I give them a pass because breakfast is not their specialty. But Biscuits is your specialty, and you're not very good at it anymore. So Bojangles has got to go. Yeah. So Bojangles maybe is a little bit, Gary. What I do is I ask for brown to biscuits. So I make sure right off the bat my biscuits are brown, but I'm keeping Bojangles. So, yeah, that's one of the things you need to do. I don't like those real, real soft, crumbly, fall apart biscuits, you know, uh, especially if I'm driving and then going to eat. Yeah. Hardee's actually makes good biscuits. They, they do. They, their thing about, uh, my, you know, morning and coming in and making biscuits, they make good biscuits. Uh, mm -hmm. Their sausage biscuit is a very good biscuit. Uh, I, I'm I'm getting rid of uh, McDonald's, although I like a uh, that sausage, egg, and cheese uh, McGriddle as a great thing, to, but it's not a biscuit. You know, it's this muffin stuff. So <laughs> for me, McDonald's is going. I do like the uh, the Chick Fil A. Uh, those little bitty small ones. Those are those are really nice. Chicken minis. Yeah. yeah. Chicken minis. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, Gary, how in the world could you wear that UNC hat, our alma mater, and sit there and advocate to get rid of Bo Jangles and score 100 points and we get the free Bo Biscuits at Bo Jangles? And you're wearing the UNC hat advocating getting rid of Bo Jangles. Now, but, hey, the way <laughs> Mac is coaching, we can get anybody to sponsor us now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, Al. <laughs> good point good point good point uh i i'm still getting rid of hardy's I, I don't think it hardy's is struggling to put its hat on a rack and claim an identity now that now that being said uh hardy's biscuits still surpass uh mcdonald's weak attempt to come with a chicken sandwich stick with st stick with what you do well yeah. Stick with what you do well. But <laughs> all right. Um moving right along. Season's too long. 82 game NBA regular season, 162 game major league baseball regular season, or the soon to be NFL 17 game regular season. All right, we'll we'll, we'll let uh, Gary start off since he has to lament 17 Cowboys games. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to say the NBA season is too long uh, because of the physical exertion. And an NBA game is never over. I, you know, 20-point lead, somebody's going to come back. 20-point lead, somebody's going to come back. Like to say, you watched the two, last two minutes of an NBA game, you basically seen it into the playoffs. So um, I think if they cut their season by 20, the NFL has got, got it perfect because whether you win or lose on Sunday as a fan, you, you can't wait until the next Sunday, the anticipation. I mean, you may, you may celebrate or mourn on that Monday or Tuesday. By Wednesday, you're regaining enthusiasm. Friday, you're planning your tailgate, and Sunday, you got the big game. And I just think less is more. And so I think the NFL has the best season. I think the NBA is too long. Dale, they're all pretty long. 
I like Gary's reasoning for the NFL uh, because baseball, you know, you got double headers, you got you playing team, you know, this day, this day, this day, a lot of games and basketball. Oh my gosh. I, I, I don't follow the NBA like I used to, but it's just like, is it still going on? Um, I think out of all of them, it's got to be a toss up between baseball and basketball. And I would probably throw out the um, basketball. Kenzie. This is easy. NBA is the longest one. And let me tell you why MLB would be questionable, right? But as somebody who's played the sport for quite a bit or softball, it's so streaky. And if you get in those games, it's a marathon. And I think we saw this year with the MLB that guys were just like, once you were stuck, if you were in a slump, that took up half your season. And that caused for teams to not be – it wasn't as competitive. It was more of the streakiness, and it wasn't as fun to watch and really like crack, like participate in. But it was still a fun and interesting season, and it was exciting. But MLB or NBA is just too long. And I'm going to go ahead and make it unanimous here. An 82-game NBA regular season. After the first two weeks of the season, we already know which coaches are going to get ejected every other week. <laughs> we, are, we, we already know which players are going to assail the officiating in the media every chance that they get. We yeah. already know that all these talking heads are going to get on – TV and talk about what's fixed. There's no point in, 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 in paying attention to anything in the regular season until we approach the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. And lastly, yeah. and most, and most importantly, the NBA, the NBA is an insult to people like Gary Richmond. What do I mean by that? I'd rather go yeah, what? to a Vance gym or I'd rather go to a Hopewell gym and watch Gary Richmond's teams play than watch an NBA regular season games. Because if I watch Gary Richmond's teams play, I'm going to see teams get on D. I'm going to see teams play defense. And we certainly don't see that. Not in the NBA. Regular season. 82 game regular season. Get out. Yeah. <laughs> and last... And since we have Kenzie on the panel here, last, and yes, this question is least because it's not even worth discussing because, because we have Kenzie McLean. So, yes, this is least. I get rid of all of them, but who are we getting rid of to, uh, to, to make way for our star here? Gary, who are we getting rid of? Between Mike Greenberg, Colin Cowherd, and Nick Wright. Mm. You know, I watch all three of them a lot, and I don't dislike any of them. Um, the only thing, the one that I disagree with the most would be uh, Nick Wright because he's, you know, you got two, two sets of basketball uh, goats. You have one group that said it's LeBron and the one – this said is Michael Jordan, and he can come up with every reason why LeBron is better than Jordan. And of course, being a Carolina guy, I'm a Jordan guy, <laughs> and he he can come up with every reason in the world why Jordan is not as good as LeBron. So Nick Wright's got to go. Kenzie, Mike Greenberg is one of my favorite sports journalists. Um, flat out, I think he's incredible. I think he does an amazing job at what he does. Um, I watched Get Up every morning of the pandemic, woke up when I could to watch it, it, it just because I love Mike Greenberg. So he stays for sure. Um, you know, I, I disagree with Colin Cowherd quite a bit, so I think he's got to go. Yeah. Well, uh, having listened to Mike and Mike so long, I really appreciate and like him. I like his just his whole demeanor. The next two kind of have these little things about them. Colin's got that little laugh that kind of gets on me a little bit. But more so than anything, doesn't Nick whine too much sometimes <laughs> when he's doing his little things? Doesn't he get a little bit whiny in his uh, – his... so Nick's gone for me. 
And just to reiterate, as far as I'm concerned, all of them are gone. I don't need to hear hype machines week after week after week, day after day after day. I want to go watch the teams play. And that's the great joy in high school athletics. I, I, I don't need the hype machines. Get them all, get them all gone. Um, I mean, they, they can talk round and round all they want to. That has That's nothing like a post-game press conference with Gary Richmond and Sam Griner uh, who get to who get to the point and say what needs to be said and let their student athletes do the talking on the field. So all these other guys can go. All right. So um, we're going to get ready for coach versus coach. Cue the music. Oh, man, I'm in the presence of legends right here. Gary, two, you go first today, man. You you legendary. Two, 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 of, the, two of us have... The age before beauty, huh? <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> two, two of us have been head coaches in state finals, and one of us hasn't. We know which one of us doesn't belong. So uh, let's go ahead and get right to it here. All right, uh, high school football season and the length of it, both of you have been involved directly with this for many, many years. The fact that we're essentially dealing with as soon as the spring is over, I mean, as soon as the spring semester is over and classes are over and the voluntary workouts begin and you go through the summer except those dead periods, and then we get to August 1st. And if you play for a state championship, as, as uh, Sam, you've been there as a head coach, we're really to mid-December. So we're talking six months effectively. Is the season too long? And what do we do about it? Go ahead, Gary. I'll let you take it. Um, in my opinion, I do think it's too long. I don't think it's as long as some other states that have a, 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 le a legitimate spring practice, which we really don't have in North Carolina. We have some form of spring practice. Then at the end of the year, most most school systems allow football workouts to begin uh, two to three days after graduation. And so you're talking about mid-June. OK, um, most of July, they get they do get a week off for the coaches clinic. Uh, but July is five weeks, I think. So um, and then you go into August. And so. They've really been going at it probably 12 to 13 weeks before they play their first game. And, and colleges, I take that, I won't say colleges, but the pros don't do it that long. And I, I think they could cut it back a little bit because the coaches have them outside all spring, uh, you know, throughout the summer. I think they could cut it back a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm not in like full disagreeing with you, but here's the thing. If you cut it short, okay, you're going to find these teams. There's too much football. Football almost pays for most of every other sport, right? Yeah. They're going to find ways to cheat, to do something. People are still going to do football illegally, and it's not good yeah. for football. You see what I'm saying? So better to keep the even playing field by letting it stay the same. Or what they need to do is – just make it known because your assistant coaches literally make nothing. The head coaches barely make anything. We we addressed that with Q earlier that football, it's not like another sport. Like, I, I mean, no, no disrespect. I love tennis. That's like one of my favorite sports to play right now. But, like, you, there's not really much off-season tennis that a coach has to do in CMS. But off-season football, I mean, it's it's a year-round job. It's, it's very difficult. And uh, I just think the compensation should change a little bit. But I like – where they do, I don't think it's too long. It's just we need to compensate the coaches. All right, uh, shifting gears here as we are in NCAA tournament time. And we had a great women's uh, Sweet 16 game earlier this week with two of the great programs, two of the great coaches, Connecticut Baylor with um, Gino Ariema and Kim Mulkey in a great game, obviously a controversial ending we all know. But uh, shifting gears a little bit. So here we are with COVID testing protocols in the NCAA tournament. 
we all heard what uh, Coach Mulkey said about stopping testing in the tournament. High schools aren't testing. Are we in a pressurized situation to look another way once we get into tournament play to finish the season? Uh, Gary, as a women's basketball coach, start us off. Well, Kim Mulkey took a lot of heat for saying that, but I think we all know that they've had a football season during the pandemic with no fans. They've had a basketball season during a pandemic with no fans. Okay. Uh, just a few for the tournament. This is all about money. And it's no way that somebody tests positive on Saturday to start at a, the final four and they have to for forfeit that game. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars at stake with the with the uh, NCAA and the CBS contract. So um, I, I do think that, you know, that type of thing could filter down to to the uh, high schools where you get a kid. You know, you, right now you're playing for a playoff spot. A lot of schools are. And those kids know on the teams that are going to be competing for a spot. Hey, we can't mess this up now. It, it, it's, you know, we're, we see our goals. We can't mess this up. And the coaches are reiterated, you know, keep your, your social distance, know who you're hanging around, keep your circle small. They're telling them all those things. So I, I wouldn't put it past somebody to, to maybe slip up and not say anything because the pressure to win at the end of the season is getting so great right now. Yeah. Sam, let me, let me, uh, let me frame that to set, to set you up off, off of what Gary said. And uh, you talk about how players can't mess this up, distancing who's in your circle. How have you approached this issue? Like I know a lot of football coaches have gone to, smaller rosters this year. We want kids, we want kids to participate in sports. We all do. But I know a lot of programs have gone to smaller rosters to tighten it up a little bit so they don't get in that or minimize the likelihood of getting in that extensive tracing situation. Uh, what have you done and uh, how does that play into this whole issue? Well, I think my administration has done a phenomenal job. You know, West Charlotte, I feel like, is always looked at, and we have to do everything with a, a fine comb. we got to make everything perfect. Now, our numbers are not that high, so we naturally – we don't have a JV team, so our numbers – but we only have one field, so it's still complicated for us. We haven't had any COVID instances uh, for football at all, and I think that that's a, a huge positive. Now, I don't think – like, I think – you know, the Baylor coach took a lot of heat, but I think that they cannot stop testing because if you already have a protocol in place and all of a sudden you stop it and then someone gets sick or killed because of the virus, something crazy. I mean, it's very, very rare that it could happen. But if it does, then everybody's going to put the blame. All them hundred millions of dollars, you know, someone might get sued. I don't know. I think that they'll they'll more like Gary said, they'll overlook it. They'll do some testing. Oh, we tested. But all of a sudden, we're pulling people to the side, like, listen here, you you stay away, da 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 and you're playing in three days, you know, such as, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yes, very much a sign of the times all, all, all the way around. And uh, both of you with excellent points in terms of the, the fiscal realities in this, which, which should not overshadow things. But sadly, as Gary said, we understand things differently. And that doesn't make it right, but yes, well said, both of you. And lastly, as we conclude tonight, so we heard Coach um, Commissioner Tucker, who was a coach too, very much, mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Tucker, speak of uh, vaccines being game changers, which they have been, and speak of her partly sunny crystal ball for going forward. So given how vaccines have been game changers thus far, as we approach the 2021-22 high school athletics calendar, should NCHSA student athletes be required to be vaccinated before 
for or as part of the eligibility protocol for next fall? Absolutely not. That okay. would be, that would be absolutely ludicrous if that happened because I'm one of the firm believers that I, there's zero chance I get vaccinated. Okay, what anybody says to me, uh, like I said, I, I I'm by that Rocky movie. You know, when he stays up over Apollo Creed, if he dies, he dies. Like I look at myself, if I get this and I ain't meant to live for it, then that's what it is. But I'm not going to inject my body with something I don't know nothing about. I'll never get the flu shot and I'll never get this thing. But plus, I'm a vegan. I can't get the virus anyways. We've done claim that it's uh, pretty obvious that we're immune to it now. So, no, definitely no vaccinations. <laughs> Garrett? Well, I'm the opposite of Sam. If... I'm not going to count on my diet. I'm not going to count on my faith. <laughs> if there's a shot to be had, I will take that shot <laughs> in my knee, in my back, in my butt, in wherever. I'll take a shot to alleviate pain. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, the kids should be required to be vaccinated to play sports, not to go to school. You have the right to go to school but you have the opportunity to play sports and there's a difference. Okay. So what if, what if you it's have to meet, what if it's have to meet a GPA, you have to meet uh, residential requirements. You have to meet age requirements. You have to meet those requirements to play sports. You got to have insurance, all of those things, right? You got to pass physical. Add the shot. Just add the shot. <laughs> All right, Dan, what are your thoughts here before we, before we wrap it up? I, I'm just curious what you think is the other state. That's a tough one because I am a liberty person that feels like you um, you shouldn't have anything forced on you. However, Gary makes an excellent point in that um, athletics is not forced on you. you. You make that choice to play athletics, and because it's a team close involvement thing, um, I, I I would have no issue with requiring uh, mm. players to have shots as a result. They don't have to play. They could. They, Kizzy, how would that go down? You're shaking your head. How would that go down? It ain't no I chance. I don't think it's fair because, like, as a kid, you don't necessarily have that right. If your parents say you can't have a shot, you can't have a shot. Mm. I mean, as a kid, like, I can do everything. I can get good grades. I can do all these things to meet the requirements, right? Like, that's on me. Yeah. But I can't make my parents give me a shot that's if I'm underage. That's not fair to the kids. Now, I think that, like, a lot of kids are going to just do it because that's what their families, you know, want them to do. And they think it's a good thing to do as well. So you're going to have the majority of people get vaccinated. I'm just saying it shouldn't be a requirement. So Gary's way of going about it, just forcing people. Let somebody that going to let me take the market. It's beat. not forcing you, guys. You got you to gotta take English and math, but you don't have to play football. That's right. You, <laughs> you have to graduate high school. I'll just say, I'll take it. Oh, yeah, I got the shot. I mean, how are you going to prove that stuff? We can fake that easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I got one. We're, we're really heavy, but I got one question that came up in the, in the chat that I wanted to put out there. Uh, Gary, is it fair for teams who aren't playing and remain unbeaten to be seated ahead of teams who play and lose? No. No. I think in order to be to be declared an automatic first or second, you have to play the state minimum of seven games. So if everybody play, else goes into the wild card. If you play less, you can't be an automatic first place. So Coach, say you got somebody three and zero who's in first; they're not playing anybody. Yes, the rest of, because of quarantine. Yes, and, and you have the the second place team that plays the whole schedule. They finish six and one. Yeah, you know they did what they're supposed to do. Yeah, they got a loss, mm -hmm. but they played the seven games. But shouldn't that three and zero team make the playoffs though? Depends on the other teams in the conference. Yeah. They, on, wow, right, wow. like what I said, they can't be a one or two seed. They could go into the wild card pool. No, no, I agree with that part. I, I just think the three and O team. I don't know. I, that's a that's a tough one. That's but a I think tough there's one. Be a lot of teams in that situation. Yeah. Dan, yeah. what do you think? I, I think it's tough to let a team in that. So you've got another team that finishes five and two. 
and you got this team that finished three and zero, and the five and two team can't go in. You're going to put the three and zero team in. Um, yeah, I agree with you. I, I think you got to play the minimum number of games first and qualify from there, and yeah, then you work the people. Minimum, minimum of five games. Like if you played five games, then you can go. And if you didn't play five games, I don't. I don't even think you should be in the playoffs. There's zero chance I think you should be in it. Okay, I'll three. put a. I'll put a caveat in here. If you do not play the minimum number of games, then use the old Major League Baseball batting champion race rule. So let's say the minimum number of games is five and you play four, then an O and one is added into your schedule. If you still win the conference, congratulations to you. So that mathematical adjustment should be made to allow for a team still to advance and balance it out relative to the minimum number of games, but the minimum number should be in effect. So I'm good if, with that. If you so if if, if I'm three and oh, but the minimum number is five, then an O and two is added into my schedule. Yeah. And if I'm and, and if I still win the conference. Then, then I'm the number one seed. Well, if you qualify, I don't know about winning. If, no, if 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 you win the if you win the conference with a three and two record, when that two in, I mean you're not you're not going to. Yeah. But just theoretically, if you do and that's factored in, then you won the conference. You only can play who is on the schedule against you. This isn't right. This isn't fair. It does. It, it it's not what we want. But we can't. There's going to be a lot of people upset who, next who, Saturday. Who's give me an example? Because I just think about CMS. I don't even get outside of CMS that much. Yeah. About who has only played, you know, like a one or two games right now? Well, Charlotte's done pretty well. I mean, yeah. I mean, like Richmond County's only played three games. And I think they're not going to play anymore. I mean, and I, I know in the, in the in the eastern part of the state, there's two teams that are like four and one that's supposed to play each other, but they may not play each other, so they both will be one loss. So that's, it's going to be tough. And like I said, next Saturday, there are going to be some teams that are really upset. I mean, it is it is what it is. It's well, all these are. It's a, so COVID, it's a COVID year. I mean, I'm, I'm just happy they got to play. I'll be honest with you. I'm happy they got to play. And I know everybody wants to play for a state championship, but the alternative of playing versus not playing, I yeah. think it's pretty cool. All right, we're super, super heavy. Sam, put you in the one shot. What you got? Just to piggyback off of what you just said, I just, I'm glad we're playing football. No one, I mean, me included, I didn't think we'd make it this far. And very proud of the Charlotte schools. Everybody in Charlotte done, has done a phenomenal job, in my opinion, that we're always playing. We're, we're doing really good with the protocols, with the mask. We're doing everything we're supposed to do, and we're allowing these kids to have a chance to play these seven games and then beyond if you're able to make it to the playoffs. So that's huge. I, I didn't think we'd make it this far, and I'm just I'm excited we did. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I know I teased to the high school Heisman, um, but we had so much happen today with Coach Odo. I didn't have time to get to it. I'm going to try to get Sam and Grice and, and maybe Chris, and we'll maybe do like a special show to, to talk about our first Heisman candidates. And we'll definitely talk about it on Monday's show. We're back at our normal time next Monday, 8 o'clock. Be there, be square. I'm Langston. That's Gary. That's Alex. That's Miss Kinsey. That's Dale. That's Coach Griner to start the show. We are talking preps. Good seeing you guys, man. Enjoyed it tonight. Mm -hmm.